It should be good. Thank you, Sean. Everything is so tall. Yeah. I used to be 6'3", but I, uh, I didn't like it. I don't know about you, but I sense, I sense the presence of God in this place today. I thank the, the worship team for making themselves available and yielding themselves and welcoming the presence of the Holy Spirit in this room. Because if the Holy Spirit is not here in the room, there's really not much point, is there? Can you say amen? Amen. amen. I love to worship God. Every morning I, I get up and uh, head to the beach. Summer, fall, winter, and spring. Every day. I just find the, the surroundings beautiful. They're certainly conducive to opening up one's heart to worship the one who created all of it, to watch the water peaceful, to watch the water angry, to watch the water just being there every single day. It reminds me somewhat of the nature of God. Sometimes our commune with God is peaceful. Sometimes it's not peaceful. Sometimes it's rough. But he's always there. Always. And I'm glad for that. And when we worship God, sometimes we can get confused in to what worship is all about. It's, it's not about us. It's about him. And as we proclaim the attributes of God, how holy he is, how worthy he is, we can't help but be encouraged in that ourselves, and that's what worship is. God does not need us to worship him. God didn't wake up this morning thinking, oh dear, I hope the church is meeting today because I'm feeling a little bit down. And I know if they worship me, I'll be lifted up and be set aright. That, that's just a silly idea, isn't it? Do you agree? Worship is for us. It's for us. If we don't worship God, we'll worship something else. We'll worship our girlfriend or our boyfriend or our job or our car or our house. We're just worshipers. That's, we're, we're prone to that. But the Bible says that God seeks such who will worship him in spirit and in truth. He seeks those to worship him. And I don't know about you, I suspect you probably would agree, I think it's a great idea for God to be searching us out to worship him. That just makes me feel safe. It makes me feel cared for. It makes me feel, well, can I use the word special? Sometimes, you know, we just take ourselves too seriously. Would you agree? Some, like we're so caught up in appearances. You know, we, we dress to the nines. We always push forward the latest style. I mean, I don't, I don't have socks on today. I feel kind of weird because I'm an old guy. I've, I've been around a while. And we always wore socks. And so I couldn't quite go with no socks, so I put on fake socks. You know, they just cover the bottom of your foot. And when you slip your shoes on, it looks like you've got no socks. And my wife put me up to that. <laughs> but you know what? <laughs> if, you start to take, if you start to take yourself too seriously, something will happen to humble you. Just a few months ago, I started wearing suspenders. That's right, Kimberly. I started wearing suspenders because when you get old, your body changes and your pants won't stay up on their own anymore. And so I, I thought long and hard, but I started to wear suspenders. And of course, my sons, 
whom one of them attends here, and I won't mention who that is, but anyway, uh, said to me, that's the last sign of old age, wearing suspenders. And I said, well, you know, old age or not, last sign or not, I'm going to wear them. One day I came home from work, and my wife, as I walked past her, she started to giggle. And then she started to laugh. I said, what are you laughing at? She said, well, if you could see what I see, you'd laugh too. Your suspenders are hooked to your underwear. <laughs> and your underwear are halfway up your back. And I thought, oh, dear Lord, I've been to Sobeys. I've been all over town. I'll bet you there's a viral video somewhere showing this old guy picking up groceries at Sobeys with his underwear halfway up his back. I'll bet there are some pictures that were taken that day, without my knowledge, of course. And so after I was getting over that, I looked down and my, my fly was down. I mean, how humbling is that? So if you take yourself too seriously, Bob, you'd never get over that. But you know what I thought? Well, at least I made somebody's day a little brighter. Yeah, I did. And now I made, just made your day a little brighter. But I don't have the suspies on, and that's what I call them, suspies. That sounds a little cooler than suspenders. But anyway, after having said all that, I want to talk to you about a very serious, serious subject. I, I was born to do this. I was born to preach, and I know that I've been born to preach. I just know that. I don't preach very often. I used to preach, uh, you know, several times a week when I was uh, a professional pastor. And a uh, professional pastor is just a pastor who gets paid. And uh, I, would, I would have to preach uh, probably four times a week. And... Um, a wise man once said to me, if a message is not worth preaching ten times, it's not worth preaching once. And so for the tenth time, I just want to share this with you this morning. I want to talk to you about a lion who goes to the dentist. Sound interesting? And by way of introduction, I just have to say this, that Jesus carries two particular names in the scriptures. One is the, the lion of the tribe of Judah. And another name that he carries throughout scripture is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Two very different pictures of the same person. Lion of the tribe of Judah and the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The writer of the book of Revelation tells us that in the end days, the lion will lay down with the lamb. And we understand that as being there will be no more animosity, no more hatred between different tribes, no more... Uh, you know, no more thinking we're above this one or that one. But I think it also means this, that the lion and the lamb, the lion of the tribe of Judah, who is Jesus, and the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, who is also Jesus, those two images of Jesus will come together and they'll be reconciled to one another so that we'll understand why both of them exist today. We need to know Jesus as the lion of the tribe of Judah. And we need to know Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. We're in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs talks a lot about wisdom. Talks a lot about knowledge. And today I want to talk to you about the fear of God. The fear of God. What does it mean to fear God? 
And hopefully by the time we're done this morning, you'll have a better understanding of that. Jesus' name, the Lion of the tribe of Judah. I don't know if you know this, but at one point in Israel's history, there was a division in the land. Ten of the tribes inhabited the northern part of Israel, and two of the tribes, Judah and Benjamin, inhabited the south part of Israel. And it became known as Judah or Judea. And the top ten, the top ten tribes, well, they were known as Israel, or even more precisely, Samaria. You can remember in the New Testament stories of the Jews and the Samaritans. That's because of that split that took place when David became king over Judah. And when Saul became king over Israel, the ten, the, uh, the ten nations together called Israel. We know that Saul, if you have read your Bible at all or if you attended church at all, you realize that Saul was a mistake. Saul was in ministry for himself. He was in leadership. He gave God no consideration at all. It was failure after failure after failure. And he came into a place where he became jealous of God's choice to lead the nation in the future. And so he found himself trying to kill David time and time again. But David always escaped from the arrows or spears or weapons of Saul and uh, and God protected him. Judah means praise. Isn't that interesting? It's interesting that the lion of the tribe of Judah, the lion of the tribe of praise, is none other than Jesus himself. Listen to what it says here in Revelation chapter 5 and verse 5. It says, And began, uh, and, and, uh, I began to weep bitterly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then, in verse 6, it says, I saw a lamb who appeared to have been slain standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. The lamb had seven horns, seven eyes, which represent the seven spirits of God sent out into the earth. Those are the two images. Those are the two titles shown to us very explicitly in the book of Revelation. I want to make this clear before I go any further. The book of Revelation is not a revelation of the church. It's not a revelation of end times. It is a revelation of Jesus Christ. It says that in the very first verse. Why is it we miss that? Why is it when we read the book of Revelation, we're looking for some kind of an inside skinny on prophecy, how the world is going to end. Try to make sense of all these images that are thrust before us through the writer of the book. When the very first verse tells us what the book is about, it's a revelation. It's a revelation of Jesus Christ. When John saw Jesus on the Isle of Patmos, he was looking at Jesus as he exists right Now, not like the buddy-buddy image that we hear about in the church so often. Oh, you know, Jesus will just coddle you. Jesus will just hug you. Jesus will just whisper in your ear how good you are and how sweet you are and how pleased he is with you. But that's not the Jesus that I see 
in the book of Revelation. In fact, John, who many believe was the closest of the disciples to Jesus, after all, he stayed there at the cross. He didn't run like the rest. He stayed there until it was over. John, who was seen leaning on the breast of Jesus in the paintings of the Last Supper, we, we see John being spoken about as the one whom Jesus loved. He was close, as close as you can get in a human body to whom Jesus is. But yet on the Lord's day, the Bible says that John was in the spirit. Now listen, John was in prison on the Isle of Patmos because of his testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ and his death and his resurrection and him being the only way, the only way to the Father God. He was silenced, or at least they thought he was silenced, and he was exiled to Patmos. Now, I don't know about you, but if that was me, I'd probably be complaining on the Lord's Day. What am I doing here? I should be out preaching somewhere to big crowds. But no. The Bible specifically says that John was in the Spirit. He was in the Spirit. He was in tune with what the Spirit of God was accomplishing through him. And when the Romans thought they had exiled him and shut him up for good, little did they know that he would be the writer that's contained in the last book of the Bible that the world is fascinated with, trying to untangle the web, trying to untangle the images that are there. And here we have their images, their images of Jesus Christ. I say glory to God. You can't shut God up. And today if you're here and, and God has been nagging you, and God nags, I know he does. You can't shut that voice up. There's nowhere you can go that he isn't. Where should I go from your presence? The psalmist wrote. If I ascend into the heavens, you are there. If I go into the depths of Hades, you are there. Think about that. Think about that awesome presence of the one that we assemble ourselves to here on the Sunday morning to meet and to worship and to hear something, hopefully, that's anointed from his word. We've been in the book of Proverbs, but we haven't mentioned yet where wisdom begins. We've talked about wisdom. We've talked about, you know, what it can do and what it does, but we haven't talked about where it begins. How many know where wisdom begins? I see one hand, I see two, I see six, eight, ten. And then the 12 that wouldn't put your hands up because you take yourself too seriously. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. There's no wisdom. There's no real wisdom without the fear of God. In fact, the psalmist wrote, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. How could someone say that and have a sound mind? You go out at night on a clear night and look up in the sky. How can someone say there's no God? During the winter, along with escapades to the beach, I like to drive through the woods on roads that have never been plowed, never been stuck. Well, almost never. 
It's beautiful after a snowfall to drive down a country road where even in the summer it's not used except for tractors and farm machinery that would use those roads. I, I drive through them with, with my SUV and I just wonder, I marvel at what's around me. I see the pristine beauty of white snow, not a footprint, not a footprint, not a mark in it. I see the, the dead trees that, that can't quite fall over to the ground because there are living trees all around it and this dead tree will fall over and can't touch the ground. And so when you drive through the woods uh, on a snowy day like that, you see death and you see the struggle to live. How many know God is for life? He is for life. In fact, he told the Israelites, I set before you life and death. I set before you life and death. And then he says the strangest thing. Choose life. I was one who needed to hear that, choose life, because I was too stupid on my own to choose life. I kept doing things that led to death, spiritual death. I kept living in a life that I thought would be successful without God. I was running from God. He was all around me, and I knew, I knew he was there. I had met some believers who who were compassionate and, and they were loving and they just began to pour into me. And it took years. It took four or five years before I finally came to my senses and bowed my knee to Jesus. And life has never been the same. I'd love to be able to tell you that it's been perfect. That my wife, who was a 10, is still a 10. She is. She's still a 10. We've been married for a long time. <laughs> she's still a 10. She still turns my head. And she was going through the same struggles that I was. And it just so happened that we were at a Billy Graham crusade here in Charlottetown years and years ago. Now, I'm an old guy. I've been, well, I, I was here when, when in Woodstock happened those of you who are under 50 are looking at one another saying what's Woodstock I was here when Expo 67 happened in Montreal in fact I was there I've seen a lot of things in my lifetime but the very best most precious thing that I've ever seen, and I've seen it time and time again, our knee, knees bowing in honor to God, in submission to God, submitting to him, finally giving up and giving it over and becoming what the Bible says, born again, born again. It's just like a new birth. It's just like your eyes are open brand new. It's like you never saw any of this stuff before. It just seemed to pass you by. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, when you bow your knee to the one who made you, to the one who died for you, life takes on a totally different hue. Do you agree? Amen. Amen. Well, listen. Oh, I didn't look to see. Oh, we don't see. Uh, do we have that slide? The lion goes to the dentist. Any dentists in here? Is Todd here this morning? Yeah. It's not about you, Todd. <laughs> really. The church is the dentist in this picture. You see, the lion is often thought of as the most fierce animal on the earth. I wouldn't want to meet a lion face to face unless there were secure bars between us. Lions are incredibly strong and it's their teeth, it's their jaws that just crush 
their enemies, crush their prey. And that image is given to Jesus, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Jesus, as John would attest in his seeing of him in the vision that he had on the Isle of Patmos, Jesus appeared as a fearsome creature. The Bible says that he glowed. The light from his face was like the sun. His eyes were like burning red coals of fire. His hair, silver. He had a sword coming out of his mouth. He, he, he was a fearsome looking creature. And the Bible says that John, when he saw him, he fell at his feet as dead. He fell at his feet as dead. And when we come into church, we just say, well, you know, wherever two or three are gathered in his name, there he is in our midst. Is he really? Is he really? It's great when he shows up. But you know what? Where two or three are gathered in my name as an excuse because only two or three people have come to the service, that just doesn't cut it. When Jesus shows up, we know it. When the Holy Spirit comes in, we know it. And who can stand in his presence? Who can stand in his presence? The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. There are three things that are widely disputed today in our world. One of them is creation. In 1859, probably the most damaging book that's ever been written was released to publication. It was a book entitled The Origin of Species, written by a fallen minister. Yes, a fallen minister by the name of Charles Darwin. And his studies at Galapagos were the ravings of a fallen minister. I think he was a lunatic. Anyone who could bring themselves to believe that human beings descended from monkeys now, you probably know some people who you think, well, you know, they're not that far off. But think about it. 23 and me. They'll search your ancestry. Ancestry.com. They'll search your ancestry. They'll go back as far as they can possibly go back. But none of them, if they could go back as far as far it can be, None of us here would ever find that our parents were monkeys. I don't know what you think of your parents. But my parents weren't monkeys. Neither were their parents. And neither were their parents' parents or their parents' parents. And on and on it goes. And there's no point in history where those parents come to be monkeys. You have to be insane to believe that. Well, we've been taught that in school, Bob, and, you know, it's, there's so much science behind it. There are just so many lies behind it, and the lies keep coming. You know, if you're told something three times, you'll believe it. If you're told something three times, you believe it. Do I have to tell you again? You know, it's, it's, I heard, I heard somebody say this one time, and, and he was making this point. Someone comes up to you and says, do you know that the average human being swallows eight spiders when they're sleeping in their lifetime? We would ponder that for a second and, you know, just let it drift away. That's interesting. And then, about three or four months later, somebody else comes up to you 
and says, did you know that the average person swallows eight spiders in their lifetime? And you're thinking to yourself, I heard that somewhere before. I can't remember where I heard it, but I did, I did hear it. And then a few months later, somebody else comes up to you and says, did you know that in your lifetime, you swallow and then you butt in and say, I know, I know, eight spiders in your lifetime while you're sleeping. Do you think I'm an idiot? I knew that. And that's how that works. If you repeat a lie long and often enough, people will believe it. We ought to know that today because most of what we hear coming over to the, the TV and the, uh, under the guise of news are lies. They're just simply lies. Lies to sell ratings, to sell commercials. You know, TV exists to sell you stuff. That's the only reason TV exists. It doesn't exist to make you happy. It doesn't exist to make you wiser. It doesn't e exist for your benefit. It just exists so that people can sell you stuff. If people weren't selling you stuff, there'd be no TV. Who would pay for it? Who would pay the exorbitant salaries that TV actors demand? You know, creation happened in a moment. Boom. Boom. One day it happened. God spoke it over a six-day period, and all things came into being. Well, Bob, you mean you don't believe in the Big Bang Theory? Yes, I do believe in the Big Bang Theory. God said, let it be, and bang, there it was. Another thing that is disputed in the church is about the power and ugliness of sin. Now listen carefully. Listen carefully to what I'm about to say. Jesus did not die for our mistakes. Jesus died and took our sin. A mistake is like 5 plus 3 equals 7. That's a mistake. That's a mathematical mistake. Jesus didn't die for that. What he died for was our sin. He died for our rebellion against God. That's what sin is. It's rebellion against God. That's all it is. It's nothing else. Every sin is rebellion against God. Every lie is a rebellion against God. How do you know that, Bob? Because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Somebody tries to lead you another way. Jesus is the way. He's the only way. He's the truth. He's not a lie. The truth of his existence is a fact. It's a matter of fact of history. Jesus lived. He died and then he rose again. Jesus also said he was the life. He was the, he was the life. He's the light of men, the Bible calls him. He's an incredible, incredible God. The ugliness of sin. Try to picture this. Before Jesus came, the blood of bulls and goats and doves and whoever knows what other kinds of animals were slaughtered, sheep, to, so that it would appease God for the time being. God had the redemptive power of Jesus coming, but at that particular time in history, Jesus wasn't here. And so all of these animals were slaughtered as an atonement for the people's sin. God told them to do that. You see, sin causes death. The soul that sins, it shall die. 
That is the law of sin and death. The sin, the soul that sins, it shall die. And it takes death to unravel that as death works backwards into life. Not one of those sheep, not one of those cattle, not one of those doves, not one of those pigeons ever came back to life. Jesus is the only one who came back to life and he still lives. He still lives. This is the one we gather to worship. He's not some old beer drinking buddy that you can just team up with and sit down and watch the cowboys. That's just not Jesus. That's the Jesus that the church has invented. That's not the one that you read about in Scripture. You know, Jesus doesn't say, oh, I know you've had a tough week, but hey, I've got it. I know you've sinned. I know all that. I know you've been doing stuff you shouldn't have. Shame on you, but that's okay. I've got it looked after. We're told we should never be ashamed. Well, I'm going to tell you something. I've done things in my lifetime that I'm ashamed of, and I'm still ashamed of them. I did them, and I'm ashamed of them. And nobody's going to convince me that that is not a healthy outlook on those things that happened in the past. Are you free from them now, Bob? Yes, I am. But when I think about them, it brings shame to me. No shame in the church anymore. No fear of God in the church. Can you see the teeth coming out of the lion's mouth? See, the church is the dentist that's doing this. We've accepted these mealy mouth, soft, peddled junk about who Jesus is. And Jesus is still the lion of the tribe of Judah. He is also the uh, the lamb that was slain for sinners. Listen. What is the fear of the Lord? It's really simple. It's really simple. Well, Bob, are you claiming that what theologians have been trying to explain for centuries, that you know the answer? Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. I know the answer. Here's the answer. The fear of God it's someone who believes that God means what he says. That's all it is. It's nothing more complex than that. It's nothing deeper than that. That's what it is. God says what he means. And he means what he says. When the Bible tells us that liars and fornicators, drunkards, adulterers, gossipers, thieves are not going to make it into the kingdom of God, you need to believe that. You might think that you're special if you're a liar. You might think that you're a special liar. You may think that you're a special gossiper or that your gossip isn't really gossip. If you're a fornicator, if you're an adulterer, you're not going to see the kingdom. You can convince yourself that that's okay. I am, a, Jesus has got all that. He's got all that looked after. I'm just here to tell you and I've got Bible to back me up, you're just not going to make it. You're just not going to make it. The man who fears God, the man who believes that God means what he says and says what he means, the one who has the, the, the humility to bow before him and to ask him to save him from his sins, the one who receives Jesus. I'm not talking about accepting Jesus. I'm talking about receiving him. Receiving him. To take him unto yourself and receive him. And open up your heart that the Holy Spirit can take up residence inside of you. This is where the fear of God brings a man. 
or a woman or a child. And this is where God then begins to move in his mercy in your life. Andrew talked this morning a little bit about freedom. If the sun sets you free, you're free indeed. There's no other freedom that compares with the freedom that the sun gives you. If the sun sets you free, you're free. You're free from sin. You're free from the pull of sin. You are free. In fact, Paul wrote to the Galatians, it was for freedom that Christ has set us free. That is it. It was for freedom. It was for freedom. You mean I have to follow a whole bunch of rules and regulate? No, it's for freedom. You now have the freedom to make the right choice. You have the freedom and you have the wisdom because you fear God to realize that this activity is destroying me and I need to repent of it and leave it alone. You have the wisdom. You have the freedom indeed to make those choices. And once you are free, you are free. But it all begins with the fear of the Lord. You know, it, it, it would take five or six sessions to make this abundantly clear to everyone and to deal with some of the nuances and questions that people would have in their minds. But all I've got, because the pads are going, that means... That means, Bob, you're done. You're done. And so let me say this to the church. If you're not someone who reads the Bible and studies the Bible for yourself, let me, let me just encourage you to do this. Start reading. Read all of it. Don't just read your, don't just read your, your, your promise cards. Read the whole thing. Read the stuff that makes you crawl. Read the stuff that makes you wonder, how can this be a loving God? Read the whole thing and read it again and read it again and read it again and again and again. Just don't take my word for it. Don't take some preacher's word for it. Read it for yourself. You'll find out there's a lot of stuff in there that preachers are afraid to touch. Because for many preachers, it's about bums in the seats. Excuse me. You know, the false prophets had bigger crowds in Elijah's day than the true prophets of God. The Bible tells us that in the end days, it'll be the same. They'll, they'll heap up to themselves preachers that will say just what they want, just what they want to hear. And so the seats get full. The seats get full, the crowds get bigger, the names get better known. But listen, the ones who labor in the trenches and warn people about the coming wrath of God that is coming upon the earth closer now, I think, than ever before. Well, I know it's closer now because it's a day later than it was yesterday. But it's coming. And I think the saddest verse in all of Scripture, the saddest one, at least to me, is this one, where Jesus says, Go far from me, for I never knew you. Yeah, but didn't we cast out demons? Didn't we, didn't we do this in your name? Didn't we do that in your name? And Jesus said, just go far from me. I never knew you, you who work iniquity. Much iniquity abounding in the church of Jesus Christ today. Much worldliness abounding in the church of Jesus Christ today. And I see some of you nodding your heads. You agree, you know, you know that it's true. And perhaps it's true in your own life. But I can tell you this today, and I'll end with this. You can be free. You can be free from all of that. You can be free just, by, just by, by beginning to understand who God is, by beginning to believe that God means what he says, and he says what he means, 
And so there you go. If you will grasp that, the Bible says, He whom the Son sets free is indeed free. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise. And we do declare today, God, that you are good, that you're full of mercy. Your grace abounds. That supernatural ability that we call grace, the supernatural ability to serve you with all that we are, that is grace. Thank you for that. We thank you, Lord, for today, for the for the faithful hands who minister in the power of the Holy Spirit, in the, in the gentleness of the one who would woo us to himself, in the awesomeness of the one who would entice us to take a closer look at who Jesus really is. And God, we the church, we the church who have, who have, who have taken the teeth out of the lion's mouth, we're asking you, God, to forgive us. And we repent of that. And in your name, Jesus, we declare truth over this place here today. We speak a blessing upon our pastor and his new wife, God, as they, as they pour themselves into ministry, as well as they, as, they, uh, as they entice with the words of God for people to come out of the shadows of darkness and begin to walk in the brightness of the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And God, for all these things, I ask your blessing upon these uh, men and women in the worship team, God, who endeavor to lead us into a place of intimacy with you. Sometimes as frustrating as that might be, God, we know that, that, uh, that even today as we gathered ourselves in this place, God, that's what's happened. That's what's happened in here today. Lord, people have been drawn face to face, as it were, into your presence. Deal with us, O oh God, in your mercy. Deal with us, O oh God, in your love. Deal with us, O oh God, with kindness, we ask it. In Jesus' name. Everyone said amen. Amen. You can stand with us if you would. <laughs>